Father, we're so glad that uh, we can come and worship you today. We have uh, been blessed with life and an opportunity to know you. And we just want to say that we are humbled and thankful. Lord, as we come to your word, um, we want to know how to handle it appropriately so that we need not be ashamed. Lord, we, we desperately want to know you, and we know that your word reveals you most clearly. So we just pray that you'd please, again, be with us, help us to understand today. We thank you and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so, uh, maybe you have heard a story told in the past. It's a fictional story, be assured, okay? And it is an, a, a negative example. But here's how it goes. And maybe you have studied the Bible like this before, too. I'll admit, I have. You wake up in the morning, you have no real plan for Bible study, and so you get the Bible, you feel like it's important, and so you go do one of these. In our story, uh, the gentleman looks at this verse, and he finds that he has turned to Matthew chapter uh, 27, and he reads, And Judas went and hanged himself. <laughs> and he says, Lord, that can't be the message you have for me today. Is that it? What are you trying to say to me? And then he closes his Bible and he says, this one will be better. So he opens it up. Uh, oh, it's John this time, at least. I know John is a book about love, so don't worry. John 13, 27. And Jesus said, what thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> and you think... Oh, no. Is that a good way to do Bible study? No. It's really not the, the best way. I, I, again, I confess, I've done it. <laughs> but I don't want to recommend that to you as the Bible study method. We've been discussing how to study the Bible, and I want to give you better tools than that. God can speak to you from anywhere in his word, of course. And I, I thoroughly believe that as you, you prayerfully approach God's word, he will do that. But I want to give you some tools and some plans. So we've been, we've been discussing that. We've been trying to figure out how do we do this. And so uh, we recognize as Christians that we are supposed to be studying. It, reading is good too. Reading's excellent. You need to be reading your Bible. Uh, we discussed first reading and devotionally studying, kind of just asking questions, trying to understand the words, make sure we don't miss anything. That's, that's a good way to do it. It doesn't always yield the deepest results, but let me assure you that if you're, you go from no Bible reading to Bible reading and devotional study, then hallelujah, I am glad you are in the Word of God. Yes? I'm very excited about that. But still, we, we looked last week at a little bit deeper dive method, which is called the inductive Bible study method, where we're looking at the details. We're trying to understand the details. What do they actually mean? How do they apply to uh, the, the, the context of the time? Who wrote them? When were they written? We're asking all those questions, right? And we're writing all that down. We're being just investigative reporters, drawing those conclusions as we get to the end, being aware that we're letting the Bible inform us, letting the Holy Spirit lead and guide. Today, we're going to go over one more uh, kind of group of methods, and I think you're probably familiar with them. I think almost every single person in here has probably done a topical Bible study before. Do you know how I know that? Because probably you've looked at a Bible study guide before, and almost every Bible study guide I've ever seen is a topical Bible study. Now, they have limitations. They're not perfect, but they're also a very good way to study God's Word. Before you open God's Word, though, there are just a few things I want us to be reminded of how we're preparing our hearts for Bible study. So first and foremost, we're preparing by praying. If we approach the Bible and we do not invite the Holy Spirit to be the one leading in our study and, and revealing to us the deep things of God, then we will miss something because 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14 says that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. That the natural man doesn't understand these things. It's kind of an odd thing then that you find at some very prestigious universities that were originally set up as Christian universities. You think of things like Yale, Oxford, these very prestigious universities that have still theology departments. 
Would it surprise you to know that some of the theology professors at these prestigious universities count themselves to be atheists? No, they're not. They, they assure you, if you ask them. No, I mean, it wouldn't surprise you. It wouldn't surprise you. Well, okay, <laughs> then there you go. But they're coming to the Word and missing one of the, the best things we can have when we're understanding. Now, let, yes, grammatical syntax is important. Understanding how to use the original language might be useful. But if we come to the Word without the Spirit of God, we're in big trouble. And so we want to make sure we're doing that. Likewise, we are preparing our, to come with a humble heart. James chapter 4 and verse 6 says that God resists the proud. Well, we don't want that, right? So that's not us. We're going to come. We're going to come with a sense of humility. What would it look like for you to approach the Bible with a sense of humility? Would it look like, all right, God, I already know everything it says, this Bible says, so let me just see if I can prove what I already know. Is that how you approach humbly? Of course not, right? When you approach humbly, there is a certain sense of, of coming before God and saying, God, I'm willing for you to upend everything I've ever known. I know that's, that's uncomfortable, and it's really something we're not used to doing. But do you know that the Word of God says that it is sharper than any two-edged sword cutting even to the marrow and the bone? Like, it's supposed to do something that challenges you sometimes. Have you ever read the Bible and been challenged? I have. I have. There have been things that I, th I thought I was quite sure of. And then as I read and I studied the Bible and tried to be open, not just to prove my own point, but to let God's Word instruct me, something changed. That is a very, very important point for us as we are coming humbly before God. Are we coming just to prove what we already believe? Or are we saying, God, be my teacher. Help me to see from your word what is truth. That's what we want. That's what we want. And the last one there I have is that you will seek me and find me, says Jeremiah, when you search for me with all your heart. Actually, he's, he's quoting God who also... Was, this was written in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29. Isn't it interesting that even Bible authors were Bible students? You know, isn't that, it, I, even in the Old Testament, they had, for a long time, they'd had the Pentateuch, the writings of Moses. And they quoted those all throughout the Old Testament. And then when you get to the New Testament, guess what they're quoting all the time? The, the Old Testament. Because they are Bible students. We also are to be Bible students, asking God to be our teacher, coming before him, being humble, allowing him to teach us. The first way I'd like to just suggest that we could learn from the Bible today is by using something called the word... Oh, nothing showed up there. They didn't copy over. Anyway, it's called the word study method. You guys will just uh, have to put up with me for a minute since there's no slide there, but that's okay. The word study method is where you take a word you don't know and guess what you do? You look it up. <laughs> I mean, lo and behold, there are words in the Bible that you probably don't understand. Are there any words that you've ever come across that are a little strange and odd to you? Words maybe like atonement, propitiation, uh, sanctification, justification, uh, things like antichrist. What do these words mean? And so a word study does not look necessarily at the topic that is sometimes included in a word, but it looks at the actual word itself. So for instance, if you were going to look up the word antichrist, how are you going to find out where that exists in the Bible? You need to look up in one of these, right? In one of these, right? Can I do the, you know, the thing? No, anyway, um, this is a big book. Do you know why it's so big? As every single word in the Bible and where it's found, how many times it's found. And then it has a definition in the back. So if you want to look up the word antichrist, you're going to be able to find not only uh, what it, where it's found, but you're going to find out what it means. You're going to be able to look up perhaps in a Bible dictionary or something like that. When most people read the word antichrist, using our understanding of the English language that we learned in like third and fourth grade, Anti means against. And so antichrist must mean against Christ. Does it? No. Weird. Weird. So what we want to understand is that antichrist doesn't necessarily mean against Christ. It means in the place of. Somebody who tries to take the place of Christ. 
You would know that if you do a word study on that idea. You see, most of the world is looking for somebody who is going to be openly opposed to Christ, who's going to show up in a physical temple over in Jerusalem, who's going to say, I am in opposition to Christ. Turns out that's not what the Bible is pointing at when we study the word antichrist. It's somebody who tries to take the place of, even look like Christ. It's a little bit different idea, right? Then, if we wanted to go further, we could do something called a a uh, a, a I'm just I'm a little distracted by that. Don't worry, I am whew, centering. Okay, good. So, uh, what happens is then we can take that word study and we can make it part of something bigger, which would be a topical study that we need to. Uh, we need to then dive into the Word of God to understand. A word study is mostly about understanding the actual word. So you might do a word study on something like money. So you look up in the Bible the word money. You look up in the concordance, money. And you're going to find every time that the Bible says money. And that's good. That helps with a study on money, right? You should look that up. But you might miss some things because the Bible actually doesn't discuss the word money very much, but it does say other things that might be very important as well. For instance, in, uh, I think it's Matthew and chapter 6, uh, Jesus says the following, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Did you hear the word money? No, you didn't. If you were doing a word study, you would have missed this verse. But if you are doing a topical study, this verse absolutely will come up. And it's probably one of the most important verses that the Bible uses to discuss our relationship to valuables. Do you understand? So a word study is part of and very important to a topical study, but topical studies are really where we get into the nitty-gritty of the Bible, as it were. So the key difference then is that of the word study, you're looking up specific words, learning their meaning, but a topical study is looking at themes and ideas in the Bible, and here's how you do it. There are seven steps. I like that. It's nice. It, it just fits, you know, something I, I like to look at. Seven steps, and I'm going to run you through these steps really quickly. So you could today... Go home and, and do a topical Bible study on something of interest. So what's step number one? You need to find an actual topic. Where do you find topics? <laughs> yes, there are topical hymns. You know where you find them? Life. You find them in your life. What are you interested in? What do you have questions about? What did somebody ask you about at work that you wanted to be able to answer in a more biblical fashion? Did one of your friends or neighbors say, hey, what do you think happens in this? What does the Bible say about that? Those kinds of things lead very easily into a topical Bible study. Maybe you personally have been struggling with something, and you want to know, well, what does the Bible say about that? That's a topical Bible study. That's how you, you come to find a topic. And, you know, I would love it very much if when, when somebody did ask you, um, I was once asked when I was at work, and I think I've told you that story before, in the corner room of, of the, the seventh floor, it's the eighth floor, eighth floor, somebody had died, and they said, oh, we think there's a ghost in there. Greg, what do you think is going on? Instead of saying, well, here's what I think, and sharing them, you know what I said? I said, well, I... I actually, I think the Bible might say something about this. Are you interested in knowing that? And we had a Bible study at about 11.30 at night around the nurse's station with about 10 other people. It was awesome. And the only way that that had happened is because I had done a topical Bible study on what happens when you die. And so I was able to point them to just a few. Now, was I able to do an exhaustive topical Bible study with them while we're in the middle of work? No. And in the same way, that's one of the reasons why a, a, a Bible study guide, while, while it can be very good, it has limitations. Because if you're looking at a pamphlet that is, you know, for instance, an Amazing Facts Bible study guide on what happens when you die. There might be 17 questions in that Bible study. There might be 30 verses in that Bible study. Do you think that's all that the Bible has to say about what happens when you die? 
Of course not. There's a, there's a great deal more. And so what you do is you actually spend the time, and that's going to be your biggest problem, right? Because all of you are overflowing with excess time. Correct? <laughs> Always a contrarian. <laughs> so, so what I would say to you, though, who do not have excess time, where it feels, at least feel like you don't have excess time, what does that mean you're going to need to do? Prioritize, right? You're going to have to prioritize because is there anything more important than knowing God through his word? He's given us his words so that we may know him, so that we may understand more about the world around us. We can have hope for the future. If we don't spend time with it, then, then that's what being a Christian is about. And so we want to actually put in that effort. It's going to take some effort because this is not maybe an easy process. So you've got your topic. Let's say, let's say your topic is because one of your, your uh, coworkers said, man, I have been so stressed out lately. You can't, even, you can't even imagine. Look, I got this going on, this going on, this going on. What do you think I should do? What do I, how do I handle this? And you're like, um, I think, and you start pontificating on how you, to handle stress, right? No, don't do it. Don't do it. You know, the best thing you could do is point them to Jesus and to God's word. But you could only do that Perhaps if you said, you know what, first, of, of course, if your friend comes to you and has real problems, what do you do first? Listen. You listen. Thank you. Some of you know that very well. You listen, right? And you, and you, you, yeah, you could ask them if you can pray for them. You don't have to give advice right away. I know it's hard for those of us who, you know, are men, right? I'll just say it, right? We, we like to give advice, but that's not always their first answer. What we should do is listen, understand, put an arm around them. Hey, can I pray with you? Something like that first. But then you go home and you go, man, I want to be able to speak to them in their situation about what does the Bible say about being stressed out? So you grab your concordance and you look up stress. And, and how many times do you see the word stress in your concordance? Zero. And you're going, man, the Bible doesn't say anything about stress. Does it? So you've got to note step two, look for related words and synonyms. So what are some synonyms that you guys can think of for the words stress or being stressed out? Worry, worry of course. Not only do you want to look up worry, but you want to look up worried. Yeah? Worrying. All these different types, because the concordance doesn't know what you're looking for. So you look up all these different kinds of worry. And then there's other words, maybe anxiety, anxious, care, burden. And so you're looking up all of these ideas and you're saying, man, I've got a list now that I'm compiling. I'm not looking anything up yet. I'm just compiling my list. You keep going and you say things like fear. Um, what else can you think? Of? And then you start thinking, of, well, what do I want my coworker to have? They have they're, they're anxious right now. I want them to have peace. And so my study about how, I'm gonna, how the Bible wants us to interact with anxiety is also maybe going to look into peace. Okay, so now I've got my big, long list of words, and it, depending on the study you're doing, this list could be quite long. Don't worry. Don't be anxious, right? Just, just look, know that you are going to benefit by doing this Bible study. Spending time in God's Word is one way that you're going to, to actually draw near to Jesus Christ. This is something, guys... Part of the benefit of doing the study will be the time you spend studying God's word. And so you'll take that long list of words, and now you're going to go through and you're going to define them just so you have a basic understanding of this at your own, for your own understanding in English. There are some words that you, you just don't even know potentially you could be studying. And so you want to actually define them. You could look up a Bible dictionary that might give you more of a, a biblical idea or where to find those things, some ideas to start with, right? But after you've defined them, now you're going to actually find relevant Bible verses, which again is going to look like, let's see if I can move to our concordance one more time. You're going to grab that book and you're going to look at that. And you, I don't know if you, any of you have really good eyes, but this is what a concordance looks like. And it says up there, G-E in the middle, which stands for Genesis. Then E-X, which stands for, and then L-E, Leviticus. And then there's no numbers. Did you know that the word love is not mentioned in the book of numbers? 
It's a bunch of numbers, right? A bunch of counting and all that kind of stuff of the different tribes. But you look at each one of these, and these are all the different references for love. There are something like 323 times the Bible uses the word love. Is that going to take you a little while to go through that? Yeah, absolutely. And if you were defining that, remember you looked up in a Bible dictionary, you might find out that love actually uses several different Greek words in the New Testament that are defined in the same way in the English. Right? So these are things that unless you dig a little deeper, you might not find out what they're really talking about. So in, in that one there, you could look in, in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 10, and it only has a piece of the verse. It says, unto thousands of them that L me. Right? Even Because it's really trying to shorten it to get all of that in there. Okay, so now you're writing these down. You're saying, okay, what are the, what are the relevant references? What are the ones that I'm going to write down that I'm going to come back to and I'm going to study more deeply? This is something I want you guys to spend some time on. You're going to end up with a big list of verses. And you could feel a little bit anxious. You could feel a little bit overwhelmed. But you're not going to be because you are just spending time with Jesus. Look, part of it is the process. Yes? Yeah, you're looking forward to getting to the end, end point. But part of it is the process. And you're going to learn all kinds of things as you're going along doing this work with God, studying his word. So we're just writing this down, all these different verses, and we're realizing a couple of things when we go back and study them. First, we're realizing that some of these verses that we're looking for might not even have the words in them that we're looking up. If you were doing a Bible study on baptism, what word would you look up? Baptism, that's right. What else would you look up? Water. Baptize. You'd look up water, maybe. Water might be a good one. Because you'd run across John chapter 3 and verse 5, where Jesus says, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven unless you have been born of the water and of the spirit, which is clearly talking about baptism in the water and baptism by the spirit. But at the same time, you'd miss it completely if you're only looking at the word baptize. But if you threw in there the word water, you'd probably be doing a little bit better, right? So you're finding all these relevant verses. You're making sure that you've got them written down. And then you're coming back and you're realizing that not all these verses are even going to be something you're going to apply to your study. If you're doing a study on a gift of tongues, what's a word you're going to look up? Tongues. <laughs> Tongue. Something like that. Are you ever going to get a Bible verse? If you look up your, your concordance with the word tongue that doesn't have anything to do with the gift of tongues, in, in all likelihood, you may, right? And so this is something where you're, you're just finding relevant verses. Now you've got your list of relevant verses. You move on to step five. You're making observations on each passage. Now we're going back through. We're, we're, we're thoroughly reading these passages. You've got your notebook, right? All of the time, you had to have your notebook, didn't you? Or, your, or your, if you like a computer or a laptop, you're putting it down on there. Because you need to be able to go back and check what you're actually doing. By the way, the Strong's Concordance is not the only way you could find that. There are online uh, good Bible resources like Blue Letter Bible. I showed you guys that last week. That to me has been a great blessing. I can look up a word right there and I can find out how many times it, it occurs. I can find all the occurrences. I can look up the original word. I can do all of that for free. It's really great. It's not maybe as good as some of the paid software like Logos, but how many of us have 1500 bucks to drop on Logos? Yes, sir. Some people take their Bible study very seriously. I have, had, I have had access to it in the past and I found it very beneficial, but I also haven't spent $1,500 on Logos. I use the poor man's version on blueletterbible.org and it's been very beneficial to me. But you're writing that down. Some of these you can just copy and paste them into your, maybe you like, who likes spreadsheets? Come on, you confess. Okay, good, there's some of you out there. You like a spreadsheet? Make a spreadsheet for your Bible study. Write it down in your notebook or your prayer journal or whatever it is you're doing. Make sure you've got some reference for these. You're making these observations. You're saying, well, what does this have to say? I'm asking questions. Are there any warnings or promises that should be heeded in this? Is the Bible author commanding the reader to respond in a certain way. You know, the Bible is very clear sometimes. It just gives us direct information. And this step is essentially unraveling what the scriptures say. So we want to be very diligent. We want to be understanding uh, just what the Bible's saying. We don't want to be adding a bunch of our own interpretation onto this. 
The sixth step is, again, very important. It is organizing the data. Okay, so now we've got all of our notes. And this could be, you're making probably a whole binder on just this one Bible study. It could take you weeks. Are you okay with that? Have you ever done a Bible study like that before? It's very different. I got to tell you, we, we were one t- at one point in the way back, before there was, you know, phones and internet and all that stuff, like when I was born, right? And some of you remember those times as well, right? Way in the way back, when people just had to go and do the, the, the hard labor, right? And if you go even further back, do you know this is how our church was basically founded? This is how this, if we're talking about the movement of the Seventh-day Adventist church, this is what they used to do. There was a bunch of people who believed in the second coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. <laughs> and they were like, hey, we want to get together and find out what the Bible says about other things. So they would ask questions. Like, what does the Bible say happens when you die? And then they would study it individually. Then they'd get together for a Bible conference. And then they would look, they would literally go over like all of these verses. And they said, well, what, is, what does this verse mean? What does this verse mean? Does this verse seem to indicate that you go directly to heaven or hell right when you die? Well, there's a couple of those. How about these verses over here that seem to indicate that when you die, you go to the grave and you wait for the resurrection uh, upon which you will then be resurrected and go to spend eternal life with Jesus Christ. Is it Which one? And there's a lot over here. And you're going, oh man, which one? And you, you actually do the hard work. It takes, it takes time. The process itself is often very valuable though. And so I want to encourage you guys. We, we might have become a little weak in this area because we have excellent Bible study guides, which are good. They're very good for sharing, for introducing somebody to a topic. I highly recommend doing Bible studies with somebody else and using a Bible study guide to lead you on that process. I do. Because when you're introducing somebody maybe to like 15 or 20 Bible topics, are you going to be studying with them for the next like 10 years? (laughs) before they they actually understand what the Bible says? No, you want to give them kind of the crash course. But listen, after you've done the crash course, what do you then do? You go again. You go again. You don't accept it. Look, are you guys going to come to the evangelistic series in late April and May? Come, come, because you need to hear it again. Yeah, you've heard it before. I know you've heard it before. Come again. Don't come by yourself. Bring somebody, right? Bring somebody else who needs to hear it. You know what they're going to do? I have talked with people who have come to a, 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 a Bible prophecy seminar for the first time, and they say, Man, I have not interacted with any of these ideas very much, except maybe when my pastor mentioned it in passing. And now I'm getting a, a more deep understanding of this, and it challenges me a little bit, because the Bible challenges us sometimes. When things are new to people, am I comfortable with just saying, well, you heard it the one time. You're good. Long as you believe what I said up front, you're set, right? Sorry? Sorry. What did the Bereans do with Paul? This is Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, somebody that we ought to admire very much as Christians. What did they do after he came and preached to them? They went back and they looked in God's word to see if the things that he was saying were according to the word of God. Friends, we become a little bit weak in this area. To where we, it, when somebody asks us, hey, man, oh boy, my, I've just been having a lot of hard times. You know, my, my mom just died. I don't know. I'm all confused. What do you, you're a Christian, right? What do you think? What does the Bible say happens when you die? What do you think? And, and we, we give them the answer, but we don't give them the authority. You knowing it is great. I love that you know it, right? I'm very glad that you know it. But if you don't give them the authority behind the explanation, well, that's just not going to be as meaningful. Doesn't it change the tone of the conversation if you say, well, hey, let's look at the Bible. The Bible says, and you actually look at what the Bible says. You actually look at a Bible verse. You know, that changes a lot, friends. It goes from just being, well, Greg says, to... The word of God said in this book and this chapter and this verse. 
And it just changes a lot. So we're organizing that data. And here's what you're doing when you're organizing the data. You're looking back over what you recorded and you're building a picture of what the Bible says about the topic. And you want to be very careful when you're doing this to be aware of your current beliefs. You all have current beliefs. If I were to ask you, what does the Bible say about hell? You all have some idea. I'm not saying you all have the right idea. I'm not saying you all have the wrong idea. I don't know what your idea is because I'm not asking you individually right now. But if I ask you, you all have an idea, right? And so what you do is you, be, you have to be aware of that idea. If you're not aware, here's what you're going to do. I think the Bible says this about hell. And when I read a verse that sounds an awful lot like it, I'm going to go, see, I knew I was right. That's good. That's great. However, if I am coming in a what way? What did we say at the beginning? In a humble way. I'm submitting myself to the Holy Spirit and to the Word of God. I'm saying, God, I want you to instruct me and teach me now. I want you to help me. So I'm aware that, yes, I have this current belief, but I'm not seeking to only prove it. I'm being open to the idea that the Bible may at times challenge that belief. Is that okay with you guys? Have you ever had your beliefs challenged? Not by somebody else, but by reading the word of God. And you say, hang on, hang on a minute. What did I just say? And you take another, you get out the glasses and you go, just a minute. Because we want to have a faithful interpretation of the Bible's discussion of any topic. It may confer, uh, confirm what you believe, but it may also challenge what you believe. After you have, you have actually done that, you had this picture of it in your mind, you've organized the data, you've made it something that is like, okay, these things say something for, these things say something against, these things uh, maybe say something um, where all the New Testament says this, the Old Testament says this, in the book of John it said this a bunch of times. You know what I mean? You're organizing the data. In fact, if you were doing a Bible study on Antichrist, you'd find that there are basically two authors in the Bible that mostly speak about the topic of the Antichrist. Do you know who it is? Who they are? One of them's John, and one of them's Daniel. Those two, those two places, actually, if you look, just looked up the word Antichrist, you might not find it in Daniel. But you would find it, and then the ideas connected with it in Daniel. You'd find it in not only Revelation, but you'd find it in the letters of John, where he gives us a lot of ideas that help us to understand the topic so again, we're understanding more fully as we're organizing the data. Only after we've done all of this hard work, and trust me, friends, this could take you a little while. But the process is what will often be valuable to you as well as coming to the conclusion. So you're going through the process, and now you get to step seven, and you're summarizing and applying. So here's what you've got to do. You've got all that in mind. You've chosen your topic. You found a relevant Bible passage. You studied them. You organized them. And now with all that complete, you come and you say, okay, let me condense this into something that I could have in a paragraph so I can understand it for myself. And so you, you're able to then say, the Bible says this about this topic. Yeah? Yeah? You could, you could summarize that. And then that would be something that you could concisely share with somebody. But you don't want to just share the idea. You want to share the authority as well. And so you invite somebody to open the Word of God as well. And then you start asking a couple of questions. After you have summarized, you now have an understanding. You've done some deep work. Now you actually ask some questions. How does this topic apply to the present day? So for instance... Uh, let's, just, let's just say that you, uh, you have now come to a conclusion about hell that it is no longer in your mind an everlasting, ever-burning place of torment and punishment. But instead, maybe more like what the Bible says, it's a place that doesn't last forever. It is a place that um, is eventually extinguished. It is uh, something that is almost merciful. Like, this is a big difference. How does that change is that, but let me ask you first, is anybody that you've ever talked to concerned about the idea of an everlasting hell? Yes, I'll tell you, this is on people's mind a lot. This is a scary idea. 
And people are worried and they think that it means something about God and they say, oh man, so is this a current, currently important topic? Of course it is. How will my life change knowing what the Bible teaches on this topic? I had somebody tell me, you know, when I, had, I, I, when I, I used to think this about, about hell, I was scared of dying. I was constantly, I was terrified. I was scared of God. I didn't know what to think about him. But then I learned what the Bible says about hell and it changed everything for me. I could approach God and know that he was in fact a merciful God like the word says. I could approach him without fear. I, could, I, could, I can face death, friends, without fear. You're going, wow, really? It did all that just learning something from the word of God? Yeah, that's what belief does. It gives us a structure for life. The third question would be, what is the application for the church? What is the application for the church? Does this change some of the way we do things? Does it change some of the way we teach things? Does it change our understanding of God? Of course, that idea would change things massively. What will change in my prayer life after learning about this topic? Am I going to be praying for people who are in, uh, in purgatory? Right? Is that what I'm doing? Some people have previously told me, yeah, you know, I, I spend time. I light candles. I say prayers for, I give offerings for people who are in purgatory, hoping that I can bust them out so that they can go to heaven. I said, well, I, you know, I, I know your heart's in the right place because you obviously have a heart of love. You want, you desire good things for people. But is that accurately portraying the biblical picture of, of what happens when you die? And they, they study it and they go, wow, well, th this is going to change everything. I, it's going to change how and who I pray for. I'm going to pray for the people who are alive. <laughs> I'm going to pray a lot for the people who are alive because I realize that when they die, that there is not a second opportunity by which they can then be retrieved into eternal life. So when's the time that I should be interacting with them about salvation? Now. It better be now. It's going to change a lot of things. A couple more questions. How is this topic going to affect my family and those around me? Is your belief changing going to affect your family? Of course it is. It could, it could bring some difficulty. It could bring a strengthening. It could bring peace. It could bring strife. I don't know. But whatever the case is, it's going to bring you closer to Jesus Christ, the closer you get to truth. Did my view on this topic change? I'm just being honest with myself now. I'm saying, God, what, what are you trying to show me out of your word? And lastly, how does this topic help me understand God better? Guys, if our Bible study does not lead us to understand God more, then what are we doing? That's the purpose for our Bible study. That's the reason we understand certain topics in the Bible. That's the reason we, we, we agonize over helping other people to understand what the Bible says about things like, like, who here loves to talk about hell? Come on now. You, you, you should. Do you know why? Do you know why you should? Because people are afraid of it. There's anxiety and worry. And you've got great news for them. It's not like you heard on Tom and Jerry. It's something completely different, friends. What the Bible says about hell is a message of peace. It is, a, it is gospel. The gospel of hell. <laughs> Come on now, seriously. And you can preach the, the Bible message and it changes everything in somebody's life. That's good news, friends. That's good news. And it helps us understand God more clearly. That is why we spend time in God's word. That's why we put in the time. That's why we put in the effort. I, I know that this has been a bit of a challenge to think about, even just consider the amount of time that this might take. But, but you want to know God. I know you do. You're here this morning showing by your actions that you want to know God. And so this is one of those ways in which you do that. My invitation to you is to open that book. Study God's word, right? I mean, if you need to open up some other books like that concordance, go ahead. You need to op you know, open up a, a program. Just be careful you don't get distracted by Facebook and YouTube and all those other things, right? Just be careful. But please, friends, open God's word. Study his word. Know him more. That is my invitation to you today. We'll end with a word of prayer and then we'll sing our closing song. Father in heaven, God, we are so grateful.
that we can come before you in prayer. We want to say thank you for your word. Lord, you have made it so clear. We've done, we've done topical studies here quite a bit because it's a good way to share uh, information. And, and we've been partakers of those kinds of studies in the past. We've seen that they can help us to understand more, but maybe, Father, it may be that we've never actually um, done those kinds of studies. But Lord, I pray that you would please be with us as we perhaps today are just committing to say, I want to spend some time in, in knowing more about what you are, are calling us to do. You know, we've done topical studies about things like intercessory prayer. That changed my life, God. You know, we did a, a, a topical study about the Holy Spirit in January. God, that changed my life. I am so grateful for the interaction that I have had with you through, uh, through your word. And Lord, I desire that for every person here. And I know you desire that for every person here. Lord God, would you please give us the time. Help us to make the time. And then Lord, as we study, I pray that you would reveal yourself to us through your word that we may know you. That's our prayer in the name of Jesus, Lord. Amen.